Crime Watch live and interactive, where you can do something about crime. There are 40 officers here from all around the country. You've gathered in the studio in West London. They come from Suffolk. They insist on being uh, spoken about first. Yorkshire, Cleveland, Hertfordshire, Dorset, Cambridgeshire, Northern Ireland, Derbyshire, Northumbria, a whole lot more besides. Each has a case that they think Crime Watch viewers can help to solve. Tonight, for example, air rifles, the guns that are still legal, and the boy who was used for target practice. No, he was actually aimed and targeted like an animal being hunted. The bullying English couple preying on the elderly in Belfast. The axe murder of a private eye. Crime Watch reopens one of Britain's most controversial crimes. Plus some really good news on earlier appeals. Tommy Morris is now 16. He lives in Abbey Wood, not far from Thames Mead in south-east London. He lives on an estate where residents put up with more than their fair share of crime. On the day we filmed there, a young mother was killed by a car and a four-year-old son seriously injured. As for Tommy Morris, well, watch this. It's very frightening to think that a simple 45 minutes can change the rest of somebody's life. On a big estate like this is, you quite often hear air rifles going off. It's just a normal, everyday thing. One day last July, residents rang police because a teenager was shooting at people on the lake. The gun was never found. Meanwhile, about 5 p.m., Tommy went out with a friend. It was a hot, sunny day. He decided that he wanted to stay at home. He didn't want to come up to his nans with us. So we said we'd be home at about 6 o'clock with some fish and chips for him. Where do you want to go? I don't know. His mum don't even know we're out on the bikes. Oh, it's got to be somewhere. What about down the manor? Yeah, we can do. We've got to go down Saw Road to get there. Right. He knew he wasn't supposed to take his bike out unless we know where he is. In fact, Tommy was only 15 at the time, and he wasn't supposed to ride his bike in the park, let alone on the road. Hey, what are you doing now? I've got to be home before Mum gets home from the chitley. Oh, you're joking. Okay. All right, Mum. <laughs> I think I could have accepted it more if it had been an accident. But no, he was actually aimed and targeted like an animal being hunted. It was done on purpose. Are you watch right, that. No, I've, I've been shot. I've been shot? I've got to get to my mate's house. What do you think I do? Who were the two who offered help? Tommy didn't know how badly he was hurt. No, I've been shot. Where was it? I don't know, someone down there. I'm going to go back and have a look. I'll go get his mum. You come home and find that your son's been shot, his lungs have collapsed, it's lodged in his liver, you're now on your way to the liver transplant, still not knowing if he was going to survive at this time or not. It was an extremely serious injury and had the potential to kill because the pellet did go through 10 centimetres of liver without really injuring a large structure. But in this case, there was no benefit in taking the pellet out. By the time Tommy's friend had gone back down Sol Road, whoever had the gun had run away. Two days later, as the police were searching for clues, an eight or nine-year-old approached them. Are you here about the show? He said he'd seen who did it, but when police rang the number he gave, the family denied all knowledge. People see Tommy walking around chatting, so they think, oh, everything's fine. But what they don't understand is that he nearly died. He could have easily died. He's, he's got to walk around with this bullet lodged in his liver for the rest of his life. Tommy, did you realise how, how badly you've been hurt? To be honest with you, I didn't realise first because it won't hurt me even though I did get shot. Then two, I got up to the hospital and the, the surgeon, Paolo, he said, dismissed you um, artery for a millimetre. 
And he said, that's when I sat down and thought I could have died over this. It really didn't even hurt that much at the time. It didn't hurt, no, at the, at the time. So do you think the guys who shot you might have thought it was just a minor prank? Or do you think they knew that there was a serious risk of, of hurting somebody badly? Well, you wouldn't take a shot at no one, would you, really, to, sh to hurt them? But for, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't think about shooting no one. And yet, Pat, I, I mean, I gather there have been lots of people shot at on the estate. I think as the film highlights, there's been a lot of these shootings reported to children sailing on the lake, fishermen on the banks. Um, we have had a number of reports to the police. I think there's probably a number more that haven't come forward, but uh, yes, there has been quite a few. H how are you now? Are you pretty much back to health? I mean, you've still got the pellet inside you. It's too close to your liver to take out, is that right? Yeah, I feel better now. Like now I've got a plumb in the job, so it's took a lot of me mind and that. I'm getting all right. What you're hoping for tonight is that more people in the estate are going to come forward. I mean, actually, the estate has really got together over this, hasn't it, and other things that have, that have happened there, but you really need witnesses now. Right. There must have been someone out there who saw me get shot, but I, re I reckon people are scared to come forward, like, just in case like, they do something or sort of threaten them. That's all it is, one area. So, Pat, what happens if somebody tonight wants to call in? but they are frightened. They're frightened they're going to get intimidated themselves. I can understand why they... Uh, or I can understand their concerns. Um, and if they were to phone in, um, we, can, uh, we can speak to them and hopefully they can come forward. But um, we, we're not in a position to discuss anything else. If people want to come forward quietly first to you and say, look, I don't want to go public with this, can they do that? Yes. They can phone here, they can phone the incident room at Bexley Police Station. The fact that the injury was so serious makes it seem that this wasn't just a, a, an ordinary air rifle. Now, this was raised in the House of Commons today, whether air rifles should be banned because of your case, Tommy. This is the, the local newspaper, the Bexley Heath and, and uh, Welling News today, talking about whether the guns like this should be stopped. But this wasn't an ordinary air gun. It couldn't have caused that much damage. We've spoken closely, or liaised closely, with the Forensic Science Service. For the pellet to have travelled the distance it did, to have ruptured Tommy's lung, passed through his gallbladder and is now embedded 10 centimetres in his liver. This wasn't any ordinary air weapon. Something must have been done to this weapon. And what concerns me more is that we haven't recovered this weapon yet. It's still out there and could still injure somebody else's son. Various people, as you say, Tommy, must have seen this. There was, of course, the guy and, and the kid who, who came up to you to say, see if you were OK. We yeah. really badly need to hear from them and anybody else. Now, apart from people who directly saw things or saw things after the event or before, or saw somebody with a gun, all the rest of it. What about hearsay? What about people who have just heard things? Is it useful to hear that too? We want to hear from anybody that can help us with this or any other of these similar incidents at all in the area. Um, it's coming up to a year now since Tommy's was shot. Um, those responsible would have spoken to friends and other people. And there's a, a lot of information out there. Um, Tommy's a remarkable young man. Any one of his injuries could easily have killed him. Um, so it's, you know testament to Tommy's strength of character that he's here with us today. Um, so we're appealing for people to come forward and help. Well, a lot of bad things have been happening on this estate. Let's really put a stop to it. I'm going to give you three numbers. There's their own live here to detectives in the studio, including Pat. That's 0500 600 600. There's the incident room at Bexley Heath on 020 8284 9246. Or on this appeal, and only on this appeal, you can text us from a mobile phone on 07 9576306306 and some pretty good CCTV now it comes from a petrol station on the A52 outside Derby and the night cashier takes us through what happened it's pretty quiet that time in the morning so there wasn't you know many people about I saw two men approach with a petrol can they approached the pump and I beckoned them to come and pay before they actually got the fuel. One started to walk up with his hands in his pocket, getting his money out as if he was coming to pay me. They wasn't sort of scruffily dressed. I didn't feel that there was anything wrong. So I just, I just opened the door and let him in. They actually apologised. I'm sorry to say this is an old up. You know, the gun was sort of straight in my face and very frightening. It, I just froze, like, 
somebody nailed my feet to the floor and I couldn't move. Just did what they said. I put the money in the bag. I didn't know there was a third man until the door was lodged open. And he was just there to keep a watch. I didn't feel the effects of it until um, about a week later when um, I practically fainted at home and uh, I was told this was called delayed shock. You know, it's not nice. Shouldn't have to go through this. Nobody, nobody should have to go through this at all. So give us a call. Dave Sisamy and a colleague are here from Ripley. In fact, they're taking calls already. Others are from Derbyshire and they're waiting at their instant room. That's on 01773 570 100. To East Belfast now and to an English couple who are causing people there a lot of heartache. She's been extremely traumatised by what has happened to her. She comes into day centre now and she's extremely distressed. She's very anxious about going home. She's not sleeping well at night. Um, and generally she's living in fear. This is an 84-year-old lady who lives alone, who is normally very independent. She attends day centre three days a week. She would come in in the morning, she'd, she'd have lunch here. She has the social interaction of people her own age, which she didn't have in community. Home again. Okay. Home again. Not at all. See you tomorrow. You're all the best. Okay, right. thank you. Right. Now. Sure. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Uh, I believe you've been up visiting the health centre this yeah, morning. Yeah, I was. I was there today. Well, uh, I'm just here to check how you're feeling. <laughs> she was absolutely terrified. Get the bag! I mean, she could have had a heart attack. Any number of things could have happened to her. And certainly, I, I feel that the, that the robbers used cruel and unnecessary force. A passerby saw a couple behaving strangely, as though the man was pushing the woman around. A third person was involved driving a black BMW or Mercedes. Ten days later. It happens so quickly you don't realise. It's something it'll take a while to get over. Words cannot explain what it's like, you know, until it comes to your own door. Yes? Oh, come on, get in there. Lie down and don't take it off. I could hear the rattle of drawers and wardrobes, but... Uh, like, she never spoke at all to me. Just lying there praying, just praying that they wouldn't hurt me. That's all. I didn't care if they wrecked the house, you know what I mean, or what was taken. Where's the money? It's upstairs. Come on. I'll show you. Where's it? It's, it's in there. It's the money. In the duvet. I need a drink of water. Come on, you. Back in the sitting room. Now stay there. Don't move for ten minutes. In terms of the wider community, people are obviously very concerned that older people who are very vulnerable are being targeted. I mean, and the reality of it is these people are soft targets. I think the people who would do something like this are absolutely despicable, beyond contempt. Well, bear in mind, the couple sharing our reconstruction, obviously, they're actors, but they were cast to fit the descriptions that we have. And remember, both thieves 
had English accents. 0500 600 600. You know, we can never tell which cases are going to trigger the best response, but we got some really strong information from our last programme. Take a look at some of the results. The biggest response was on a case that goes back almost 20 years. Police now believe that one man was responsible for at least seven rapes in South Yorkshire between 1983 and 1986. Over 250 viewers rang detectives in the studio, including several women who think they were raped by the same man. Detectives say they've got some strong leads and they're working their way through several names. John Quinn, who's also known as John Daly, had two outstanding warrants for burglary against him. We showed this picture of him, and thanks to information from a viewer, he was arrested just a few hours after the programme. CCTV of people wanted in connection with the theft of jewellery from an antique centre in Gloucester. As a result of viewers' calls, there's been one arrest, one person has been eliminated, and the other has contacted the police. More CCTV showed these two men stealing from an elderly woman. Police are following a very strong lead which points to one of the men, but they still need your help in tracking down the second man. Who is he? We hope to have some news on this soon. There was also a very big response to our reappeal on the murder of Michaela Haig. We took over 150 calls, some with detailed information. The same name was mentioned three times, and police think they may now have the breakthrough they've been looking for. Joseph Barton was wanted for the fatal stabbing of a shopkeeper in Liverpool. As a direct result of Crime Watch viewers, he was found in Manchester, arrested, and has been charged with murder. Nigel Lazenby was one of the faces on December's programme. He was wanted for distributing obscene images of children. Knowing that he'd been on Crime Watch, he went to the police himself. He was arrested and charged, pleaded guilty, and has just been sentenced to six years. Tonight we're getting some very strong calls indeed on the shooting of Tommy Morris. He was the 15-year-old shot by uh, uh, an air gun, an air rifle in Abbey Wood in south-east London. The same name is coming in again and again and again. I've got four here, all with the same name. We've had names coming in on text, people, uh, people dialing, dialing in. Uh, we've got somebody who says that they were shot also with an air rifle. I'm not sure that they yet reported to the police. They weren't seriously injured. We've got somebody giving some details of how the rifle might have been modified. There's a lot coming in on this. There are details of all the cases on tonight's programme on the website, incidentally. Take a look at it if you're online. It's uh, on the World Wide Web. You just put in bbc.co.uk, then forward slash crime. Meet Keith Eldridge from the Met in South London. He badly needs your help with his case. It's left a family devastated and a four-year-old girl asking where her mummy has gone. It was around 4.30 p.m. on Thursday the 10th of January when Jacqueline was walking down Acre Lane with a friend towards McDonald's. Match my, um, my dress. Take care, I'll see yeah. you. See ya. They parted company and sometime after that, Jacqueline's thought to have gone to her flat nearby. She's a very quiet girl. She doesn't go out very much. She was uh, trying to be a journalist. She was studying media. She was next seen at around 8.30 in the evening, walking down St John's Crescent. She saw someone she knew in a silver grey car and got in. She has a four years girl called Lexis. She cries a lot and the first, first month she was asking for Jacqueline every time. Her body was discovered dumped in an electrical store cupboard underneath some residential flats in Kennington. If they are still outside there, they will do the same to other people, to other young girls. So the pain to me is terrible. 
He did, it's a horrible crime. And, of course, it's left a little girl asking for her mother. It, it has. Lexis is only four years old. She's now without her mother. She's devastated by this. We really need, do need to find who did this. Why did someone want to do this? We, we really don't know the motive. Uh, in fact, there's a lot about Jackie's life that we don't really know. Uh, she stayed with her friends sometimes, she stayed with her mother sometimes, but there's lots of parts of her life that we don't really know anything about. We, we'd like to hear from any of her boyfriends, any other friends that can fill in those gaps in her life. And she was known, she was Jackie Naiko, she was also known sometimes as Jackie Atin. The silver car that we saw there in reconstruction, that's got to be a good clue. That's right. We're fairly sure that she knew the male passenger. He got out the front of the vehicle and, and greeted her. She was quite happy to get in the vehicle. He, he was a black man, lighter skin than Jackie, medium build, wearing dark clothing. Jackie got willingly into the car. But as I say, that man was a, a passenger in the vehicle. I don't know who the driver was. Perhaps it was a minicab. Uh, we'd certainly like to speak to both of those people in that car though. Because of course it may be that the driver knew nothing about what was later to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jackie was found just in her underwear. What about her clothes? What happened to them? That's right. We saw in the reconstruction there that the, the coat that she was wearing, that was a fairly distinctive coat. But we, we haven't recovered any of the clothes so we, we'd like to see, hear from anybody that's seen that coat around. She was wearing some beige trousers, a black zip-up top, uh, a, a woolly hat, black knee-length boots, Perhaps they've been discarded somewhere. If anyone's seen them, we'd like to hear from them. And, and, and one of the, of, of all the things that, that you've yet to find out about this, one of the mysteries is she was last year on a Thursday. You believe her body was, was, was dumped horribly on a Saturday night, Sunday morning. So where was she in between? We really don't know. We haven't found anyone yet that saw her that weekend. Uh, we're fairly sure that she went willingly into that vehicle, but after that we don't know. Perhaps she was held against her will, perhaps she was at a party. Uh, we, we'd like to hear from anybody that saw her that weekend. OK, Keith, well, you heard there, she's left a daughter behind who's continually asking for a mother. Jackie, Jackie Naiko, Jackie Atom, she was just 24. Her family is distraught. There's a reward of £5,000. Call here, 0500 600 600. Now, here's the head of Sussex CID, Jeremy Payne. The crime shown on this next piece of CCTV could have caused a disaster. A cashier working on his own at a petrol station in Mitcham refused to let this man into the shop. After hanging around for a bit, he poured lighter fuel over the pile of charcoal and lit it. The cashier was at the back of the shop and didn't realise what was happening. Fortunately, two customers extinguished the fire before it spread. Who is this man willing to start a fire in a petrol station? If you know him, give us a call. Even with CCTV, it's sometimes hard to tell who's done what. One of this group was involved in an attempted robbery on a man who'd just withdrawn cash from a machine. A friend intervened and retrieved the wallet. Seconds later, he was attacked and punched in the face. If you can identify any of the people in this group, it'll take us one step closer to catching the attacker. This man, who called himself Steve, was caught on CCTV at a petrol station just before an attack left a young man in Grimsby unconscious and badly injured. Can you tell us who this man is? If you can help with any of these crimes, please call us now. 0500 600 600. Coming up, the axe murder of a private eye. Crime Watch reopens one of Britain's most controversial crimes. An ordinary night out in Hull, but a very unusual crime. And the arsonists in the northeast who have a strange obsession and are causing millions of pounds worth of damage. Crime Watch is remarkably successful with cold cases, inquiries that have avoided detection for years, or in this case, decades. In fact, this one goes back to 1987, but it was highly controversial from the start and has been ever since. When the night has come and the land is dark Oh, I won't be afraid. Oh, I won't. Don't stand by me. 
How could I have had my son taken like this, taken away from me like this? And what sort of people do do this? This it almost defies the the, the feeling, defies description. Almost, it's cruel. It's evil. It's awful. He harmed nobody. Daniel was a good, honest, hard-working. And a nice man. Yeah, firmed up all the contacts for Newcastle and um, it was pretty well all arranged. 37 year old Daniel Morgan was a private investigator in South East London. That night, after work, he dropped into the Golden Lion in Sydenham for a drink with his business partner. I'll have a pint of bitter and. Just a brandy and lemonade for me, please. So you reckon we'll have it all wrapped up in the day, then? Oh. Right. And your drink there, sir. Thank you. He was popular, Daniel. He was very uncomplicated and very easygoing. But his job took him out and about quite a lot, and I think he quite liked that. I believe he was very successful. He worked very hard. Have you collected the money yet? Yes, sir. Dropping it off tomorrow. Fancy another one? I really ought to go soon. All right, then. Yes, sir. Uh, brandy and lemonade, and bitter, and uh, a couple of packets of plain crisps, please. There were two packets of crisps found where his body was, and one obviously was for Sarah, and the other for my grandson, Daniel. Gotta go. Give me a call tomorrow. Yeah, sure. Watch how you drive. Yeah. His partner left about nine o'clock. Daniel finished his drink and a short time later left through the rear of the pub into the car park. At about 9.30, a large, pale-coloured car was seen leaving the pub car park. I think there's a body or, or a dummy out in the car park. You're kidding me. No, I'm not. Come and have a look. All right. You're all right, Neil. Calm down. Please. Sometimes it seems years and years, centuries away, and at other times it's very becomes very vivid. The sort of impact it makes, I can almost hear that phone call. Excuse me. Can we get back? Me, I can't move on. I want to move on move so desperately. Move back. Move I mean, back. I'm soon be 75, and I just would love to have a few years of peace. Of mine. Dave Cook, the reason this case has been so controversial from almost the start is that one of the investigating officers, one of the detectives involved in the early part of this inquiry, finished up running Daniel's agency. I mean, fishy or what? We acknowledge there were some difficulties in the early stages of this investigation, but I'm here tonight to reinvestigate it with the advantage of 15 years of knowledge and hopefully through this appeal get the nugget of information which will solve this case. Daniel's partner is in prison now. Uh, again, that must raise questions. I assume it's nothing to do with this? Absolutely. His role as a private detective, he planted drugs in a woman with a view to get in custody of the child on behalf of the woman's husband. He's now doing seven years. Did Daniel get involved in stuff like that, or was he clean, as far as you know? Daniel was a family man. He may not have played by all the rules in his role as a private detective, but I certainly would never describe him as a criminal. So, at the moment, with no evidence that Daniel was ever involved in, in criminal activity, no motive, presumably, how can people help 15 years later? The Metropolitan Police have got a reward of up to £50,000 for any person... Five zero, fifty thousand. Fifty. 50. 
for any person who can give me information which would lead to the arrest and charge of those responsible. Fifteen years on, there's someone out there who has a relationship with someone in the past. Their allegiance has now changed. Come forward, give me the information that you've got that will allow me to solve this case. It's an extraordinary cold-blooded killing. He was killed with an axe to, to his head, was left embedded in his head. I mean, somebody really, really wanted, wanted him dead. Even at this remove, are people going to be worried, you think, about coming forward? People always have concerns, but I'd like to make it quite clear, we're here to help them as much as anyone else. There is £50,000 available. You can call us in confidence, in complete confidence, and we'll treat whatever information you give in that way. We reconstructed an interesting thing about a car leaving the, the pub, the Golden Lion in, in Sydenham. You don't know where that car came from, or you don't know where it was going, you don't know if it was involved in this at all. We obviously need to trace that. Yes, we don't, we, we're quite confident not everyone in and around the pub that evening came forward. A number of people who still may know something that happened, we would like them to call us this evening. And that includes the driver of that vehicle. They may have been involved in the murder, they may just merely be a witness. We don't know, we would certainly like to. 10th of March 1987, long time ago, but of course anybody who was in the Golden Line, this case was in the headlines so much, they'll certainly have remembered the fact that they were there in Sydenham that night, not something they'll have forgotten. Even if they don't think that they saw anything important, you still want them to call? Absolutely. What The information they hold may be of no relevance to them, but it's certainly relevant to me now. OK, and it could, of course, uh, make somebody £50,000. Call here in the studio, or if you prefer, you can call direct to the incident room on 020 8358 155. In fact, people are calling in on that case already. And let me just uh, remind you about the bullying couple in Belfast, if you remember, they were robbing the elderly. Two people have called in saying they've been approached at home by these same people. Fortunately, they turned them away. A number of names have come in too. Someone's offering a reward as well because they're so disgusted by that crime. And let me just uh, tell you, the armed robbery at a petrol station in Derbyshire, we've got very good information on that. A caller says he's 100% sure who they are. He's given names, but you haven't left your details. Can you please call again? The police want to speak to you. You are so sure. Please call us again. Now, Hull and an ordinary Friday night out, but a crime that was anything but. It's very rare for an attack like this to be committed by a woman. <laughs> a group of friends out for a 30th birthday party in Hull city centre about two months ago. A bit of a pub crawl, but nobody was drunk. The atmosphere was friendly. And for a single mum, it was a special night away from the responsibilities of looking after her three children. It was a good atmosphere. We were having a good night. We all decided to go to the vet row bar because we didn't go, want to go to a nightclub. It's a pub and it's not. It's open until one o'clock. The rest of them walked in in front of me and they wouldn't let me in. I have no idea why he stopped me. In a way, I was bothered that he stopped me. In a way, I wasn't. It was a good night and I just wanted to go home and I'd just go to bed. I don't live that far away. I was carrying my handbag with me. It was on my right shoulder. When she was on Car Lane, another woman started following. She had a cream jacket on, but maybe she was aware of the CCTV systems from where these pictures come, for she started to alter her appearance, reversing her jacket and letting down her hair. I had no idea I was being followed at all. I walked over the bridge, just carried on walking. I didn't hear nobody, didn't even hear no footsteps or nothing. I just felt someone pull, a pull on my shoulder, and I turned round and she said, give me your bag. I just couldn't breathe. She just ran off. Then I got a sharp pain in my stomach. I just put my hands there, and the next minute I just swallowed blood. It happened so fast, it was just real quick. I remember stumbling. The next minute I was on the floor. In fact, she'd been deliberately stabbed in the stomach, puncturing her liver. While a man went to her aid, another saw the thief run back up Clarence Street. She was in deep shock and was unable to talk for some time. She was suffering from the wound to her stomach. It was potentially life-threatening. And at that point, clearly the focus was on getting to the hospital and getting some uh, medical treatment urgently. There was a distinct possibility that uh, she wouldn't survive the night.
The next day, she underwent emergency surgery. It saved her life. But if someone hadn't found her as soon as they did, there's little doubt this would be a murder inquiry. The thief is in her 30s. She's short, overweight, with long, dark, wavy hair and a local accent. 0500 600 600. The detectives here are waiting for your call. And now from the National Crime and Operations Faculty, here's DS Jackie Haynes. Rape is a devastating crime, but with the help of CCTV, we may take these next three cases one stage further to being solved. Kent police are investigating an allegation of rape on a woman in a Folkestone hotel. The victim was seen earlier that night in a kebab shop talking to two men with Scottish accents, and one called the other one Huey. Now we need to speak to them to see if they can help. And now an allegation of male rape which took place on Hampstead Heath in London. This picture was taken by CCTV cameras at Belsize Park tube station around the time a student was accosted. We need to speak to this man. Tell us who he is. Another serious attack again in London when a woman, a young woman, accepted a lift to Brixton. Now we want to trace this man whose street name is Lassie, but we need to know who he is and where he is. You can call us anonymously if you want, 0500 600 600. Now some news of yet more cases solved, thanks to Crime Watch viewers. It seems that Crime Watch reaches parts that other appeals cannot reach. Remember the Bradford riots almost a year ago? Over 300 police officers were injured, some very badly, and there was over £10 million worth of damage. This is Mohammed Nadil Abbas throwing stones at the police. He was identified and charged with rioting. But he failed to turn up at court and disappeared. So detectives came to Crime Watch. Little happened on the programme night, not surprisingly, since he'd gone to Pakistan. But word soon spread, and hearing he'd been on Crime Watch, he flew back to the UK and handed himself in. He's pleaded guilty and been sentenced to four and a half years. A viewer recognised one of these two stealing clothes from a store in Guildford, Surrey. We showed this CCTV back in March. The caller thought the lad was Nicholas English, and once police had his name, they soon discovered he was wanted for several other offences. The theft was added to that lot and he's been sentenced to a total of seven months. But that still leaves us with this youth. We never did find out his name. Tell us who he is. And people are telling us a lot of things tonight, uh, not least on the Belfast um, attacks where we've got these two English people, this couple. Uh, we've got two people now offering rewards so upset by the crime. But interestingly, perhaps the most interesting one I've seen is a police officer who's called in from Pontefract who says he's absolutely sure who this couple are. Their MO fits, their description fits, everything fits. On the air gun shooting uh, in South East London, the same name has now come in ten times. We've possibly got some CCTV available on that, which is absolutely intriguing and a great deal more besides. Now to uh, Haverhill in Suffolk, a primary school where two old friends share the cleaning. Yeah, apparently she's not at all good, yeah. Apparently, yeah, I spoke to her yesterday. Before we go in, we just say hello to the teachers or whatever, go to the cleaning cupboard and start work. We just get all our cleaning gear out, just get on with our own bits. There you go. Right, I'll take them back now then. OK. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. Nice. Bye. She has all the classrooms down one end and I'm up the other end. So we don't see each other unless we need something or when we're finished. Once we've finished all the cleaning and everything, we go and check that all the windows are shut in the classrooms. So she was just shutting the window and he come up behind her. He had a knife and tried to rape her, but she fought back and bit him on his cheek, hard enough to leave a mark. He cut her and kicked her, but eventually he fled. I saw her coming towards me. Immediately, something was dreadfully, dreadfully wrong. I mean, her whole body was convulsing. She, it was, you could see she was, it was really awful. She said, I've been attacked, I've been attacked. Soon afterwards, a driver noticed a man of a similar description heading down School Lane towards Burton End. She noticed him because he kept his head turned away, as if he didn't want to be seen. There's several things which we may be able to put together which might help to solve this crime. Firstly, the, the man was armed with a craft knife, just like this. 
It was described as having very short fingernails, as though they were bitten, uh, but also that his hands were very rough, uh, and perhaps he's somebody who works with his hands, works on a building site. Uh, and Haverhill is an expanding town. We need to be aware that this, this man may have come to the area to work on one of those building sites. She's been in the school, but I mean, it is traumatic. It is, everything brings it back all the time. She's been very brave, but I mean, you're looking everywhere you go, you're looking. I mean, it's not knowing who he is or where he is. So someone came home that Friday night, about a month ago, with a bite mark on his right cheek, maybe scratches on his chest. He's around five foot 10, unkempt with bushy eyebrows and hairy arms. And remember the rough hands and the bitten fingernails. 0500 600 600. Dorset police need to track down Philip Bradshaw. He's wanted for a serious sexual assault on a 13-year-old girl near Dorchester. Immediately after the attack in March, he disappeared. He's short at five foot six and has a Humberside accent. In fact, he comes from Hull. James Boyle is wanted in connection with a series of distraction burglaries against the elderly. If you see him, don't approach him, just call us. And do you recognise this man? He's Christopher Blake, but maybe using different identities. He's wanted for questioning over sexual attacks on a child. He comes from the North East, and Cleveland police have been trying to find him since 1994. He used to be a JCB driver. Is he working for you? And this man, Patrick McKerney, has been charged with conspiracy to commit burglaries, 35 of them in all. And the victims have been vul vulnerable elderly people. There's a warrant out because he didn't turn up for trial at Peterborough Crown Court. He's got a strong Irish accent and is known to frequent betting shops. Patrick Porter is wanted for questioning in connection with a violent attack on two students in Liverpool earlier this year. Now, we know he's from the Bootle area, but where is he now? And this is another man who failed to turn up for his trial, Abdullah Hassan. He's been charged with supplying drugs by the Metropolitan Police, but he's been missing since early last year. Where is he tonight? And where's Craig Swain? Humberside police want to talk to him about allegations of indecency against a 14-year-old boy. They'd also like to know more about deceptions at guest houses near Scarborough. He may be moving around the country with travellers and possibly using the name Talon Rockway. Have you seen him? And if so, where? Now you might recognise Liam Ford as a fo former footballer with Plymouth Argyle. Since then, though, he's been charged with heroin offences. Devon and Cornwall police have been looking for him, for him since he skipped bail last year. He has family in the South West and in Yorkshire. If you've spotted him or indeed any of our other faces, please get in touch. 0500 600 600. We're getting some really strong information. As you can see, the officers all around me are on the phones. The phones are really busy tonight. That stabbing in Harlow, if you remember, that was a, a, one woman who stabbed another woman. A very unusual crime. Had some very good information on that. Her name's come through. And also on the Daniel Morgan case, that's one of our cold cases. We're getting some very good information on that. Uh, a number of people who, who have very good leads on that, some very good contacts, will be following those up straight away. One of the most serious crimes sometimes fatal, often dangerous, and always a tragic waste of money, is one that curiously gets little attention. It's arson. And this is one of the most prolific and weird examples. Fire Brigade, it's Fire, one of you bought a fire on Scotswood Road. What's on fire? Um, the van. Over the last year, there have been 15 arson attacks at truck depots around the northeast of England. So far, nine have been linked by scientific evidence. These attacks are very sophisticated attacks, using a very simple method to cause maximum damage. They're targeting HGV tractor units, that's the, the cabs actually used to pull the trailers. They're attacking compounds. On a, a weekend, it's happening about 9.30 in the evening through to the early hours of the morning, uh, usually on a Sunday, whereby they've got the least opportunity of being discovered. The only CCTV of them is vague, but it shows that two men are involved. The attacks are not spontaneous. They've involved a good deal of preparation.
but they've been fairly naive as well. We've got a lot of forensic evidence from, from the scenes. We have the bottles that have been used for pouring petrol into the cabs. We also have the, the fuses which they use to ignite the accelerant in the cabs as well. The damage so far amounts to more than £16 million. We were attacked on the 8th of September last year. Uh, I was woken up by the police phoning me at midnight to say there was a major fire on in our depot, which is on the north edge of Tyneside. You initially think, you assume, that it's an electrical fault that has caused one lorry to catch fire and that it spread to all the others. Turns out that wasn't the case at all. I never expected to see 11 burnt-out lorries in a row and they were still on fire when I got there. It's quite a traumatic sight. Perhaps it's drama the arsonists are after. After all, there seems to be no sense to the attacks. Initially, we thought it was a, a random arson attack. As the, uh, the incidents started to repeat themselves, it became a lot more serious. And as we delved into it, it was apparent how serious it actually was. In 25 years, I've never known arson on this scale involved in this type of property. Steve, here, it's not just the damage in terms of, of property, but uh, I gather one truck driver got the fright of his life. I think it's a bit more serious than that, Nick, because that truck driver had actually, for whatever reason, wanted to sleep in his cab that night. The, these tractor units, of course, have beds often actually above the the area where you drive? Yeah, it's where, I mean, the, the, he's a tramper, he, he, sleeps, he sleeps in the cab, and, and what happened on this occasion was that these two individuals, these two arsonists came along, were preparing to attack the vehicle, had broken the window... And of his own vehicle? Of his own vehicle. He was asleep, he wasn't aware of what had happened. They broke the window, poured petrol in, um, and thank God a security guard came along, otherwise he would have been burnt alive. It's extraordinary these guys have not been caught on CCTV more than they have. We had some pictures, we haven't shown many of them because they can see there are two people, you can't identify them. But a lot of these depots have fantastic CCTV. I think that's a very good point that you make. The thing I would say is when we initially started this investigation, one yard that was attacked has a brilliant CCTV system. What they didn't do was actually put the tape in the machine. Uh, we've, we've, we've obviously tightened that up now and the security in good yards throughout the northeast of England and indeed around the rest of the country, um, it has been tightened up very, very significantly. It's, it's hard to fathom a, a reason for this, uh, unless they're doing it for kicks. I mean, one of them at least must have been bragging. I mean, surely it's a whole bunch of people who know who did this. I, th I think that's a, a very good point as well, because what's, what's actually happening there is somebody will be wanting to brag about this, they'll be wanting to get this off their chest. They're committing very, very serious offences. And they'll be coming home stinking of smoke and petrol, presumably. Yeah, their clothing will be absolutely soaked in petrol from, from the spray and the, they will be smelling of smoke because the fires are so intense. And it's uh, almost always on a Sunday night, incidentally, coming home late on a Sunday night. The haulage industry already in serious trouble uh, economically has nonetheless put up a £16,000 reward. I should say a lot of people lost their jobs. These are their lorries. Without the lorries, they've got no jobs. For heaven's sake, let's stop this once and for all. 0500 600 600 or 01661 863 301. This next appeal is aimed largely at just two people, two girls who went on holiday to Tenerife. Did you stay at or visit the Laguna Park One holiday complex in Playa de las Americas between the 2nd and 9th of May 2000? If so, please, please get in touch if you haven't already done so. Paul Finan was in Tenerife then too. He was a lovable, gentle giant and was there with eight mates, but something went tragically wrong. Somehow, Paul fell to his death from a fourth-floor stairwell window. Initially, it seemed like an accident, but as witnesses came forward, it began to look more suspicious. Other guests heard shouting. Some say he was chased along the landing, and maybe he'd been punched. Ernie, these two girls, first of all, you're so keen to talk to. Why them? Well, they were seen on a number of occasions that week with Paul and his group of friends. They may have been residents at Laguna Park 1. But I know that we're at Laguna Park 1 that morning that Paul died. They spent quite some time, about 20 minutes, in the reception area 
and from there they made a call back to England and spoke about Paul's death to someone in England. We want to stress they're not suspects in any way, are they? Absolutely not, I will stress that. Not suspected of any involvement at all. And I'm not interested, really, in any activities that they were taking part in in Tenerife. I really know that they've got vital information that will unlock the mystery of Paul's death. So what do you know about them? Well, both are white females, both mid-twenties and about five foot six inches tall. Uh, one of the girls was described as very attractive, long blonde hair to the shoulders. Um, she had a tattoo at the base of her back in the style of Chinese lettering. Her colleague had long dark hair which was permed, but she often wore a baseball cap and the hair in a ponytail and of course through the hole in the back of the cap. And you know they're English, though so you're not sure which part of England they're from. We're not, no. They could be from anywhere in England. And what about Paul? He was just, what, he was just 27, he had his whole yeah. life ahead of him. Paul was a member of a very loving family. He was that gentle giant, as you've described him earlier. He had a girlfriend, he had a job, he travelled the world, he enjoyed life to the full. He's never been in trouble with the police and he would turn away from trouble. He really is a son that any family would be proud of. You've spoken to a lot of people, you've spoken to, what, 350 people so far. It's just possible that there are still people out there you haven't spoken to who were at the, the complex. Yes, I, I'm confident that there will be residents and visitors that we've not managed to trace, and I would urge any of them, if there's any information at all, please contact us. We want to try and resolve this for Paul and his family. OK, thanks very much. Well, Ernie was telling me earlier, in fact, that Paul's mother, father, sister, they are living and breathing this tragedy every day. See if you can help them tonight. 0500 600 600. Calls so far are looking fairly promising, I have to tell you. On the Folkestone Rape, uh, we've got five people giving the same name. Somebody's given us a location. Uh, Belfast, the couple who've been attacking elderly people, an intriguing issue here because they've been seen at a station. We're pretty sure of that. And if so, there may be CCTV of them. On the air gun shooting in South East London, 12 people have given the same name. We've had 14 text messages with information on that that we haven't yet got a direct witness. Uh, on the Hull stabbing, one woman uh, who stabbed another woman uh, really, really seriously. The same name has come in, come in twice on that one. Now, don't forget, you can contact us about any of the cases featured on the programme via the website, if you're online, www.bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. And uh, you can see details there of tonight's appeals. All the numbers of the incident rooms are on CFAX on page 621. And our phone lines are open till midnight tonight, as always, and again from 7.30 tomorrow morning until midnight. We'll be back at 10.35 with the Crime Watch update. It looks like uh, we're going to have some pretty good progress reports, so don't have nightmares, at least not on our account. Please sleep well. Good night. Good night.